Bibles, we're going to be going to the Old Testament. In the book of Ezekiel. Going to chapter 41. Some of you may be familiar with this. I preached this about seven or eight years ago in a uh, building. I preached this in several other ch churches in Maryland and outside of Maryland. yesterday put it aside for several hours as I was contemplating on preaching for the book of Revelation and felt again to come here. Amen. I have a baptismal certificate and um, I, I hope this name will be pronounced correctly. Tikira, Takira, Thompson, Takira Thompson. Sealed with the wood of 
around about and from the ground up to the windows and the windows were covered to that above the door even unto the inner house and without and by all the wall round about within by the measure God is measuring verse number 18 and it was made with cherubims and palm trees the house of God was covered with cherubims and palm trees so that the palm tree was between a cherub and a cherub. And every cherub had two faces. And so the picture is between every cherub on the house or the walls of the house, the walls of the temple. Every cherub faced a palm tree. And each of the cherubs had two faces. And so you would have a cherub, and then one face would face the palm tree, and the other face that the cherub had, the angel had, would face a palm tree on the other side. I'll keep going. Verse number 19. So that the man, the face of the man, was, was toward the palm tree on the one side and the face of a young lion toward the palm tree on the other side. And just so you can get the context. So these cherubs, these angelic beings would have two faces. If one face was the face of a man and the other face was the, was the face of a lion. It may seem as insignificant, but when I finish, you would know the significance of these symbols in the house of God. Again, verse number 19, so that the face of a man was toward the palm tree on the one side and the face of a young lion toward the palm tree on the other side. It was made throughout, everybody say all. Through all the house, round about, throughout the whole temple, from the ground unto the above the door, from the ground to above the door, were cherubims and palm trees made. You could not walk in the house of God without seeing cherubs with the face of a man and the face of a lion or the palm trees. The wall of the temple dropped down to verse number 25 as I close with those two verses of scripture. And there were made on them on the doors of the temple cherubims and palm trees even on the doors like as were made upon the walls. And there were thick planks upon the face of the porch without, and there were narrow windows and, and palm trees on the one side and on the other side, even other windows, and on the sides of the porch, and upon the sides of the chamber of the house. Planks. You walk through the house, the temple of God. The book of Ezekiel, this is the, the last temple. When you look at Solomon's temple, you'll take note that there were palm trees and cherubs, these same type of cherubs, the face of man and the face of a lion. On them. And so every time you would walk in the temple, you would see these symbols on the temple walls. I want to preach to you on this topic the mystery of the palm tree. The mystery of the palm tree. Won't you praise the Lord? Clap your hands while you're being seated. 
When reading of Solomon's first temple in 1 Kings chapter 6, if you need that for reference, in 1 Kings chapter 6, you find cherubims, which are angels, and you find palm trees engraved on the walls of the temple. Here in Ezekiel's temple of the future, well, if Ezekiel's vision of the future temple, he saw these cherubims plastered all over the walls. And he took note that the cherub's face was towards the direction of the palm tree. And on each side, in the face of a man was on one side and the face of the lion and these cherubs and the faces of the cherubs were strategically placed so that the cherub's face had to look towards a palm tree. Now I want to add that when you look at the specifications and the dimensions and the measurements and the symbols uh, that God ordains, they always had significance. They are not something that just was thought of, just, oh, I might as well just paint this pretty picture, and, uh, and, and it really doesn't have any meaning or any value. Everything that God determines to do there is a meaning, there is a significance in that. God is full of wisdom. He's full of understanding. And, and when God begins to uh, tell us uh, what to, to write or uh, how to measure things or what symbols he want on his instruments and his walls, he would give instruction. They always had a, a meaning and a value, and oftentimes he would give us the meaning and the value, and but sometimes he would not. And here we have uh, God given uh, a, a, a vision uh, of uh, his future temple to Ezekiel, and Z Ezekiel, the prophet, was uh, responsible for writing down exactly what was uh, what he saw in the vision. Everything God did was not coincidental. It was not accidental, and it was not significant. God was illustrating a divinely inspired concept and principle. God was uh, inspiring the prophet at, at that particular time and Solomon as he built the temple, inspiring Solomon how to, to uh, prepare the house of God uh, because it wasn't Solomon's house it was the house of God. It wasn't Ezekiel's house it was the house of God and God had specific instructions and direction. If we're going to get close to him and if we're going to come into his presence and worship him, we must understand how. We must be given instructions so we know how to please God. Noah was given instructions on how to prepare the ark for the saving of his soul. Noah could not make the ark based on his own uh, intellect or based on what he what pleased him or based on his own preference. He, he had to get instructions by God. God told him the type of wood. He told him the type of uh, adhesive that would cause the, the wood to stick together. He did not tell him to get nails. He, he gave him specific instructions and, and dimensions and measurements. He, he wanted a certain way. He did not say five stories. He said three. He did not say four doors. He said one. He did not say ten windows. He said one. And I want you to position it like this. Why? Because it is the ark of the Lord. It is the salvation that you need in your life. And I, only I, the Lord, knows the instructions and, and how to get you to the right place. And you can get the, the, the most educated uh, semen there is and the, 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 the best builder you can find and, and you can get the professionals and they know how to build the Titanic, but the Titanic sank. 
I'm sure they used the best steel and the the, 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 the heaviest rivets and uh, they had everything right right within the, the engine room and everything else and they said this thing could never sink. And here God saying, hey, I want you to make this ark of gopher wood. And I want you to pitch it within and without it. This is how you're going to do it. I'm going to I'm going to give you the instructions, and when I give you the instructions, this thing is going to be right. And so God began to give instruction or to show this, this temple. And I want you to note some of the things that were in this temple, if you will. We, we, we see these things. We, we, we see this cherub, cherubims. All over the walls. You could not escape it. You would look to the porch and there were cherubims. You would go and, and look on the door and there were cherubims. You would look on the, the windows and you would find cherubs. And the, the, the cherubs represented the angels of God. It was the, the supernatural manifestation of God. It was letting the people of God know, hey, there is more than meets the eye than you can see. There's a supernatural God at work. There are angelic hosts and beings that God is uh, overseeing and that will be in the life of those who believe in. I'm telling you right now, there's all Always the angels of God operating and working in the kingdom of God. I'm so glad there is more than I can see. There, there are more for me than against me. You can complain about everything that's going on wrong in your life, but you better realize, hey, God is in control. And I'm telling you what, you don't know the times that God delivered you. I know so many, so many people want to see angels. You don't want to see an angel. I don't want to be around you when you see an angel. <laughs> but you might, you might need some pampers. <laughs> you can fill in, fill in the blanks. Scare you to death a prophet one day with his servant and they had it bad. They were surrounded by the enemy. Now the servant only saw the enemy but the prophet saw the God and the army of God around the enemy. And he said open up this servant's eyes so he could see and when he opened up the servant's God opened up the servant's eyes God, the servant saw that they were the enemy, I mean, the, the army of God surrounded the enemy. And so, and he could not see that at first, but God had to open up his eyes so he can see the supernatural realm. Can I tell you there's a supernatural realm at work? We're not in this thing alone. We're not by ourselves. God has an army marching through the land, and sometimes it's not just the, uh, the physical army that we see. Hey, the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. I'm telling you, they are more for us. I'm so glad I don't have to rely on myself. I can call on the name of the Lord. And hallelujah, there's something to somebody fighting. The scripture says of Daniel, he began to pray and he prayed for 21 days. And there was warfare going on in heaven. And, and the angel finally showed up to Daniel. He said, Daniel, I would have been here a long time ago. But for 21 days, uh, I was fighting with Michael, the archangel. And we were whipping up on some devils. I'm telling you that right now. And the, the, the prince of Persia came against us. And, and we had to fight against him. And hey, and there's another prince that's going to come. And we were wrestling and fighting the prince of Greece and Greg getting ready to come. There's warfare, warfare going on. I want you to know that you can't see. I'm here to tell you right now, there's warfare going on in this world, in this country. The powers that be. You can wonder what's going to think, oh, this thing is, is natural. and You know, hearing this 
impeachment trial. Boy, that, come on. I don't feel like hearing all that. I'm like, just do what you're going to do. Get this stuff over with and all that, whatever. But it's more going on than meets the eye. You can sit up here and blame man all you want to. Join this side, join that side. All I know is anything that's going to be for the things of God, I'm for. <laughs> Other than that, they're all alike. Oh, no, they're not all alike. Boy, they got differences in as far as the policies and everything else. But I'm telling you what, right now, they're just, I'm telling you, anything that, oh, hallelujah, anything that, that, that is as close to this is what I want, period. And I don't care what party. I don't care what name is on it. Oh, yeah, some of you got quiet. Because some people get more allegiance to a political party than they do to the book. And I know I'm off the subject. Oh, no. I get my answers from here. Because they had four years or eight years. What are you going to do after that? I mean, so many, so many people were just so high four years ago. When Obama was president, they were, oh, they were floating. Wait, he's out in the office. What are you going to do now if he was your God? Yeah, I said it. On a Sunday morning. I know you bent out of shape. But I mean, people were worshiping him. They were talking about putting him on a dollar. Or Bill, he wasn't even dead yet. They said, forget putting, forget it. He don't have to die. Put him on a dollar. We worship you. I don't mean no harm. I'm not worshiping any man but Jesus Christ. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what their color is. I don't care if Jesus is black, purple, and blue. Hey, I'm going to worship him. I'm not putting my trust in man. Forget that. Now, I'll vote. Sometimes you regret what you vote for. Sometimes you're proud of what you vote for. I don't know why I got off on that. Let me get off quickly. We can see and understand God creating or allowing, directing uh, the symbolic uh, nature of an angel or cherub on the wall. We understand that we should have a supernatural, spiritual dimension. And uh, let me tell you this, your walk's supposed to be supernatural. If you're just relying on your flesh to get it done, you are selling yourself short. You say, in God's house, God expect there to be the supernatural. God expect there to be the cherubs and the cherubims. Hey, when you come to the house of God, if there's not a supernatural move, go to another house of God. If all they preaching is religion, if all they preach is man-made stuff, all they preaching is for you to be a good person, I'm sorry, nobody's good. No, not one. We all fall short of the glory of God. Amen. I, I need the supernatural to work in my life. I, I need the power of God. I need the blood. I need the spirit of the living God. I need the angelic host uh, to fight my battles. I can understand. When there are angels on the walls in the house of God, uh, we can comprehend the fact that we serve a supernatural God. Invisible, all-powerful, can do all things. He's beyond all time and space, not just covers all time and space. We understand that supernatural God, and so we can identify with God's uh, presence. And we can also, even though we don't like it, we can identify with God's divine order as he measures his temple. 
God has a divine order, and when he began to measure, it connotated his divine order. You see, God is not going to allow us uh, to measure things our way or determine how things should be done according to our understanding. And he says, when you come to my temple, when you get into my house, uh, I'll do the measurements. I'll determine what's right. So he measures and he determines. We can understand God measuring the court uh, and God measuring the house and, and God measure God measure everything in your temple. Measure everything in your house. Now here we go. You see, we the Bible says we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Know ye not that you are the temple of God? In the book of 2 Kings, Samuel built a physical temple. In Ezekiel, there will be a physical temple. But I have a question for you. What is the temple of God right now? It's you that's sitting on the pew. God says you are the temple of God. You are a representation of me on the earth. And I determine how things are going to be measured in your life. I'm the one who's going to bring the supernatural realm to work in your life. There ought to be the supernatural the natural working if you are the temple of God. Yes. If you are the temple of God, God's going to measure your life. God is going to determine the bounds. How far you can go. Oh, so we can identify with the divine order of God. We understand that. Even though we may not like it sometimes. God will say, hey, you can't go here and do that. And that's why people say, I don't like the church because they're trying to tell me what to do. I don't like to find that type of church huh? because they have rules and they have regulations. Let me find a church uh, where there are no rules, uh, where I can just do anything. Uh, you want that type of church uh, where no one can tell you what to do? Uh, you want to be that type of Christian uh, where there's iniquity? I want to be in a church uh, that's defined uh, by the measurements of God. Uh, let God tell me how far I can go. Let him tell me where I can turn, uh, when I need to stop. Uh, I want the God of this world to rule my life, uh, the God of this universe to shape and mold me and to define divine order in my life. I need his divine order. He sees what I don't see. He knows what I don't know. And while this flesh may not like it, uh, God defined the lines that rule my life. I don't like rules and regulations. You don't like any sport, any game. And please don't get in your car and drive because there's a line that tells you you can't go on the other side. There's a stop sign that says you got to stop right here. There's a red light. There are yield signs and right of ways. Yeah, you don't like rules. I understand. I got a question for you. How do you govern your house? What do you do in your job? You don't have any regulations. Yeah. We understand that. We're familiar. With the identity of the lion on the wall. Do you understand the measurements? The angelic host, the face of a lion, denotes strength, denotes power. It symbolizes authority. Authority in God's kingdom. We can relate to that. Because we know that there's power 
in the name of Jesus to break every chain. Break every chain. It doesn't matter what chain you have in your life. It doesn't matter what's a chain of addiction, a chain of pornography. I don't know what it could be, but God is able to break every chain. Maybe you have anger issues. Maybe you have shame and guilt. God is able to break the chains. There's power. Wonder working power. There's power to change your life. There's power to reform you. Hallelujah. There's power to pick you up when you're down. I'm not talking hypothetical. It's not hypothetical. I'm not exaggerating, hyperbole, it's reality. God took a 25-year-old man that his relief was indulging himself in chemical, whether alcoholic or otherwise. I needed a happy hour to get happy. I needed a club <laughs> to give me some a sense of whatever. I don't know what the club did. But all along, I was empty inside. And sin had me bound. Sin was my ruler. And my taskmaster, it told me where to go and what to do. It controlled my life. And I realized I wanted to go. Oh, I needed someone else or something else to be Lord in my life. And when I surrendered my life to Jesus, amen, he filled me with the Holy Ghost. And now I'm serving another God. I'm not serving my flesh. I'm not serving my own desires. I'm not serving my own ambitions. I'm not serving, hallelujah, things that my flesh would want. Because of his power, his authority, and so I can relate to the lion, the lion, the tribe of Judah. I can understand the temple of God. It should be the supernatural taking place. I can understand the temple of God. There's authority represented the lion. I can understand the temple of God having measurements. Y'all with me? These symbols on the wall. And I can definitely identify as we look at the symbols on the wall at the face of a man. You have the face of a lion on the one side of the cherub, and then you have the face of a man. I can definitely relate to my humanity. I can come in here on a Sunday morning. On a Sunday night, and I, amen, I'm going to show you my best. Oh, hallelujah, you show me your best. But only you know when you get in front of that mirror and you see the real man. You see the whole man. You see the broken man. You see the frustrated man. You see the fallen man. And we, if no one else can identify, we can identify with the face of the man. It speaks of our frailty. It speaks of our humanity. It speaks that we fall short of the glory of God. And I don't care how powerful you are as a child of God. And I don't care how much you get it right in your measurements with God. And I don't care how angelic the, the hosts are that are with you. You're still going to see the face of a man in your life. You're still going to see your humanity. You're going to still see when you fall short. 
You're going to always see that in the temple of God. And you must understand that uh, in the temple of God. Uh, you must give yourself a little credit. You must get off your own back and say, when you see that broken man, when you see that frail man, uh, you see that man with infirmities and weaknesses that can't seem to get it right uh, when you're trying to get it right. That person uh, that won't pray when they know he has to pray. Uh, that person that gets anger when he should be showing peace. I understand that frail man. We understand that. And we need to. Because that doesn't undermine the fact that we are the temple of God. Oh, hallelujah. Amen, amen. Sometimes we can be our worst critics. Uh, and all we do when we come to the temple, all we do when we're trying to get in the presence of God, we just look at the man's face on the wall. We don't see the cherub. We don't see the lion. We don't see the measurements of the house. We look right at the, the face of the man. Look around you. It's bigger than that. And so we see all those. I, I'm preaching this thing so long, I, I'm sorry. Nowhere near where I need to be. But then there's this palm tree. I can understand all those other things. Now I don't understand the palm tree, but because I preached this about 10 times, various places, and maybe not 10 times. But, but then there's the palm tree. I, when I first read this, and as you know, who those of you who have heard this message, how many of you have heard this message before? Raise your hand. So how many of you who haven't heard this message before? Raise your hand. Well, yeah, it's different. It's always different in the Holy Ghost. And <laughs> the palm tree. And that's the palm tree. I'm like, okay. I, I'm reading along and I'm like, okay, this is, man, this is, I can understand this. I can I can definitely understand the cherub, and I can understand the lion, I can understand the, the man's face and measuring the temple. Like, well, what is the deal with the palm tree? Why do you stick palm trees in, in, in front of the lion's face and the man's face and between the cherubs? And, and I, I don't understand this palm tree thing. Maybe you want us to take a vacation. Hey, that's sweet. Hey, living in God is like living on a beach. I don't think so. So the palm tree was between every face. So when you have the face of a lion, you have to look at the palm tree. The face of the man, you look at the palm tree. When you look at the windows, you saw palm trees. Amen. You look at the doors, they're palm trees. You step out on the porch, they're palm trees. There are palm trees everywhere. You're like, what? What's the mystery? The palm tree. So the palm tree for me, when I see a palm tree, and I know some of you are already there, you've heard this before. When I see a palm tree today, it's an iconic figure that means relaxation. It means comfort. It means murder beats, baby. <laughs> right? Right? Or Florida. Or California. And when you see the palm tree, you think, okay, it's time for the Bahamas. Or a uh, 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 you know. Or maybe Jamaica, mom. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah, man. Judge ready. <laughs> Be happy. You think of all those things when you see the palm tree. You think of serenity. Oh, if I could just get here. You feel relaxed. Everything is going to be okay. And true, that's the symbol of the palm tree in our day. It's, it's serene. It's peaceful. It represents calm. It represents everything is going to be okay. 
you can kick back, sit, put your feet up, and that's the symbol of the palm. And so when you, as the temple of God, hallelujah, when you look at yourself, there ought to be a peace in your life. There ought to be some tranquility. They ought to, you, you, you know, when, when people look at you, they're like, okay, this is, this is, I, you know, when people get around you, I, 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 and I kid you not, this is the way it is. You can, I'm not, it took years to get there. But people come to my house, they say, your house feels so peaceful. I'm just going to tell you about 25 years ago, it probably felt like a landmine. Watch out when you step in there. You're going to expose. But a child of God, the temple of God's life should be marked by peace and tranquility. That people can come and say, yes, I want to be around this. I want some of this to rub off on me. You see, there's turmoil, there's uh, frustration, there's anguish, there's war, there's all sorts of things. But I see something different working in your life. I see a peace that comes about you. Hey, you are a child of God. You are the temple of God. I know you have power. I know you exercise authority. Amen. I know that you you have the traits of a man also. And I know you allow God to measure your life by what things you do and don't do. But there's something different about you. There's a peace about you, buddy. It's the temple of God. That's what we see. But that's the external thing about the palm tree. Hidden secret. A mystery that's locked up in the palm tree. You see, the palm tree was not initially thought of as a vacation spot. It wasn't a place that was thought of in terms of sandy beaches or the ideal climate. It wasn't felt uh uh, as though it was a place of tranquility and calm. You can mistake in the palm trees on the wall and the impression of the palm tree based on its exterior beauty. But it's something more that's hidden in the mystery of the palm trees on the walls of the temple, you see. Uh, in old days of old and in the times of past, uh, the palm tree wasn't just a place of serenity. In the past, in history, it symbolized victory. It symbolized triumph and competition and in the battle. When one would get a palm tree or take the branches of a palm tree, they would turn it into a reef and they would put it on the conqueror's head. And it denoted he conquered. Even though that was a battle, he wasn't defeated. It represented triumph. And so when the Messiah on what we call Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter, came in Jerusalem, the city of God, riding on a donkey. They began to lay palm trees out because he was coming in as the king of kings and the lord of lords. They begin to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who came and comes in the name of the Lord. He's the king of Israel, coming with power and It was a sign of victory. And it wasn't just serenity. You see, there's something hidden in the palm tree. If we, if we, if we were asked, if we were, were going to be a, a type of tree, we would want to be the mighty oak. Standing firm and tall. But the palm tree, you see, is different. You see, the palm tree hallelujah, has something hidden. And it's this. The mystery of the palm tree is this. It, when adversity, 
because you will have adversity, meets resilience, who's going to win? I said when adversity meets resiliency, who's going to win? If you take notice of that picture, there was some adversity that came down in that town. It wiped out everything. But in the midst of the adversity was a palm tree that had some resiliency. Oh, hallelujah. You see, this is the mystery of the palm tree. Where there's a storm that comes. Oh, hallelujah. The palm tree bends. As it goes along with the winds and the storm. But it has that uh, that tenacity and that uh, uh, what you would call ele uh, elasticity. No, I don't want to say elasticity. Elasticity, that's what I wanted to say. You get two points. The elasticity to fall down and get back up again. I got a question for you. If you are the temple of God, you have that, oh, hallelujah, that nature of the palm tree, that when adversity comes, you have the resiliency to get back up again. Hey, I may bend, but I won't break. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah, the devil may try to take you out. Amen. You may, may not always stand erect, and that's okay. And so when people look at your life, go on the call. They want to be around you because of the aura you present. But also during the storm, they wish they can be like you. Because even though you bend, you won't break. Even though you fall, you're going to get back up again. Rejoice not against me, oh my enemy. For when I fall, I shall arise. Somebody need to have uh, the re re resiliency of the palm tree that's determined, you know what, I'm going to get up again. Now, let me tell you something about the palm tree. When adversity meets resiliency, adversity never wins. I want to know if you have adversity. More importantly, do you have resiliency? The meaning of adversity is the state of hardship. Do you have any hardship? It means misfortune. Some of you cry about your misfortune. Adversity means a condition of difficulty where circumstances or situations work against you. Sure, you're going to have things work against you. But what I want to know is do you have resiliency? Resiliency means the capacity to recover from your difficulties. Yes, I have difficulties, but I have the ability to recover from them. It means it's the ability of an object, put yourself there, to spring back into its normal shape and position after being stretched and bent over. Oh, I'm stretching, I'm bent over, huh? but I'm going to get back up into my normal position. It speaks of elasticity. So this is the thing, while other objects are plummeted by severe storms, the palm tree has this uncanny tenacity to stand against the worst conditions. I'm talking about hurricane uh, strong winds, uh, hurricane four, hurricane four winds and five. And guess what? You still still see the, the palm tree stand. Now, this is it. You look at yourself and say, well, some things have been shaken. My leaves are broken. Now, see, the leaves are gone. But those leaves are somewhere out there as a sign of victory. There's a palm tree that's still standing. And the palm tree that 
place somewhere that said, you can't move me. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying in the church. Nothing will defeat me. Who shall be against me? Hey, I'm telling you what, you must have the resiliency of the palm tree. Just give me a few minutes. Give me a few minutes. Just a few. See, this, this is the mystery behind the palm tree. During tough times, the palm tree's roots go deeper in the ground. And it makes the storm actually makes the palm tree stronger than it was before. The more storms, the stronger it gets. The more storms, the more roots. And, and get this. As the wind blows and the storm comes, this is how the, the palm tree works. Its roots are designed to search out water. And the more uh, storms, the water comes. And so the palm tree roots begin to stretch out. When the storm comes, I want to know, are you looking for the water? Or are you looking for shelter? When the storm comes, uh, your roots are stretched out. And actually, the storms make the palm tree stronger, better, bigger, more enduring. It's under the pressure of the storm that you grow stronger. Search for water. Stretch out further. Can I tell you the storms are not meant to weaken you. It's meant for you. It's meant for you to gain strength. Elder Brown, what you've gone through the last month. Oh, hallelujah. You couldn't breathe. Your daughter's in and out of the hospital four, five, six times over the last month. Uh, it's not meant to weaken you. Uh, God is strengthening you uh, in the battle, uh, in the storm, uh, through your difficulty, uh, in your troubles. I'm going to be uh, a palm tree uh, in the temple of God uh, that when things come against me, Oh, everything got to face the palm tree. Uh, whether it's the lion, uh, the face of man, uh, it doesn't matter. Everything has to face a palm tree. You will have difficulty. There must be resilience. Oh, I got a whole lot, but I'm done. Well, I want to know. God said in my temple, uh, this is what you're going to see. Uh, I want to know uh, in the temple uh, that God created, uh, is there any palm trees? Uh, is there any resiliency? Uh, hallelujah. The mystery of the palm tree. It's when adversity leads resilience. I don't know what you've been through in your walk. I don't know what you've been, what you're going through right now. But I believe somebody, if you've been taking the palm trees down, oh, hallelujah. Ain't your temple, it's time to plant some more. Now get this. I thought I was done, but I got one more thing to say. While most species of palm trees endure harsh conditions, most species of palm trees, there are a few species of palm trees which do not. Now, these type of palm trees that do not, one that comes to mind is a, a queen palm. And these they don't grow high. And they are normally planted for pleasure 
in appearance. And so they people put them in the front of their yards to have the appearance of that tranquil nature. But these particular palm trees, they say, they are very hazardous. And they are easily plucked up and pulled up in hurricane winds. Reason being because they have shallow roots. The roots doesn't go too far and they are easily exposed. And so in some places, they have banned these type of palm trees. And it's against the law to put them and to plant them in your yards because they are so dangerous during storms. I pray that there are none of those type of palm trees here today where you, it's just a show. When people see this temple, I want, to, I want them to see the cherub. I want, them, I want them to see that my life is governed and measured by God. I want them to see the face of a lion and the strength of the authority. And yes, as a pastor, every now and then, I have to let people see my humanity. Because I'm a man. More importantly, of everything else, I want people to see I have a tenacity for palm tree. I'll bend under certain conditions, but I'm going to come out stronger than ever before. Won't you stand, please? I pray that you would have that resolve. Won't you stand? That no matter what goes on in my life, especially in these days, Elder Valley, everything that you've been through, if you've been through something over the last little while, I want you to come up front and stand. Come on, in Jesus' name. Maybe your body is frail. Maybe your body is weak. But that has nothing to do with your inner man. God is saying, you know what? Hey, out of the mouths of sucklers, I have ordained strength. Uh, I have perfected praise. And hey, great is he that's in me uh, than he that's in this world. Uh, I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're going through. But I'm here to tell you that you can have the strength of a palm tree. I'm going to bend. Come on, come, come, come. But I'm not going to break under these conditions. This is the mystery of the palm tree all over the house, especially those who come. Won't you just lift your hands up? And won't you just go ahead and go ahead and acknowledge God? Amen. I, I, I'm sorry for looking at things the wrong way. I don't want to be the wrong type of uh, a palm tree that just looks right and looks good. And, but I want to be the palm tree, oh God, that you plant in the right places. Come on right now. Come on in Jesus' name. I said your troubles and your trials, uh, your storms is in your life. Uh, it's, God is not trying to topple you. He's not trying to have you to topple down and to be destroyed. Uh, but God is trying to strengthen you. Come on right now and all over the house just for a few moments. Won't you be determined in your mind? I'm going to be like the palm tree. I'm going to get back up again. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. All over the sanctuary, won't you just lift your hands where you are? Make a proclamation. Hey, I'm going to allow God to, to measure every area in my life. I'm going to allow God to lose his angels, his power, his glory in my life. Hey, I'm, I'm not going to put myself down when I see my humanity. But I'm not going to be toppled by my storms. Come on in Jesus' name. follow me. I know I'm an overcomer. I will always give praise. Come on, that's it, somebody. The one who forever reigns in him I trust. Come on, God is at work in your life. I will God is at work in your storm. His grace brings me. He's making you stronger. He's making you greater. Come on in Jesus' name. I Why don't you be determined? Why don't you 
Don't you have your mind made up? In Jesus' name. I'm a person of destiny. She cut down my heart. Follow me. And I know I'm an overcomer. I will always be the race to the one who forever reigns. In him I triumph every day. Grace and mercy, God. 